I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today on the James Altucher Show. When you look at someone in the eyes, it's permission to ask a question or to engage in a conversation. So for the teacher to look in my eyes or a fellow classmate to look in my eyes in relation to anything to do with studies would be traumatic. Particularly if the teacher, because maybe she's going to call on you to come to the board and write the answer. Yes, exactly. And I was called many times to come to the board and it would just be embarrassing and I'd see kids kind of snickering or laughing or, and it was, you know, incredibly uncomfortable. You know, I couldn't read at all. And so... It caused a lot of shame. You know, you're some sitting in second, third, and fourth grade, and teachers are looking at me to answer a question, and I'm looking at my shoe or trying to find my way out of the class because I knew I didn't know the answer. I knew I couldn't know the answer, and it it was incredibly embarrassing to me and uh, hard. Yeah. And so then what I found later in life is just the opposite worked so much better. I could really expand on my relationships by looking directly at people, by doing the exact opposite, look them right in the eyes, make my soul available to them, my heart available to them, and theirs to me. And that's when you get authentic stuff from people, is when we create that bridge that is honest and excited about meeting somebody. Do you think these curiosity conversations that you write about in A Curious Mind and also led to so many of your movies, Obviously, this was kind of an outgrowth of how you taught yourself to learn, which was so different than from just reading and writing and, and so on. Right. Well, it is how I taught myself to learn. I mean, I'm probably a classic autodidact in that sense. Like, I just constantly importing information, but from people usually, just from conversations. My kids would always go, who do you think you are, Dad, the mayor of Malibu? Because I literally will say hi and with an, you know, with an open heart to people and... It doesn't ever go wrong. I mean, it always, there's always something to be gained, even if it's often just making somebody feel good. It validates the other person for being a human being. They're sort of like channeling the collective consciousness or something, aren't they? Or what are they doing? Well, you feel, uh, with, with Richard Pryor, he was, he made that switch in his career, I think in the late 60s, from kind of, safe comedy to really hey i was born in a whorehouse yeah and then this happened and yeah. it just went is it, it was like the tell reality you a crazy comedy. richard pryor story not yes. on for this i'll tell you my richard pryor story on this thing so i'm at this is totally confidential right no way are we rolling now we're rolling oh yeah okay. so uh okay, okay we okay turn it off and I'll well, tell this can be pretty raunchy if you, i won't say the names of the people i can just tell richard pryor okay yeah keep it on then okay then keep it on <laughs> So anyway, I do have a couple of Richard Pryor stories, and why, what m- makes me ignite those is uh, we're in a comedy club right now, This, which I haven't been to this club, but it's really awesome, and it makes you really think about the comedy because you have these great guys 
I have a story on every. <laughs> I'm looking at Rodney Dangerfield. His famous thing was you got to go after back to school. He was a superstar. I had to go try to grovel and get uh, Rodney to do a show, a movie. I wanted him to do a movie. And I don't know if you know the story. He sits there in a bathrobe, naked. He always at this at the Sunset Marquee Hotel. You go and meet uh, meet him. He's in a bathrobe, and you're trying to do eye contact, and it's impossible to not look at his dick because he had a very big kind of Milton Berle <laughs> kind of thing hanging out, and it, he just would do that to fuck with you. But that was his thing. He Did you get well, him in the movie after that? <laughs> I didn't get him in the movie. No, I didn't get him in the movie. Uh, so, now, do you think... So I'm just going to give a little intro just for a second. Brian Grazer, one of the top producers of all time in Hollywood, uh, uh, ranging f movies from Splash, which you mentioned, to Apollo 13, to A Beautiful Mind, which you won the Oscar for Best Picture, to one of my favorite movies, 8 Mile, and another favorite movie, Blue Crush, and yeah. my favorite TV series, Arrested Development, and other great TV series like 24, Empire, blah, blah, blah. Do you get tired of people introducing you like this? <laughs> like, you've kind of created my culture oh, that thanks. I grew up in, and and as an adult, because <laughs> you know most of these movies were, like, 8 Mile just, like, changed my life, that movie. Wow, thank you. See? Thanks. No, I, I definitely don't get tired of it. And I'm every conversation I have with anybody is always a new experience. And um, I was just watching you and usually people read it, but you had them right in your mind, which I was really impressed. Thank you. Yeah, I, I had what? You knew the names of oh, the movies oh, yeah. and the things right in your mind because you'd lived them and experienced them. So I thought that was cool. Yeah. And and also your, your book, uh, A Curious Mind, which is all yeah. about your stories of your curiosity conversations. And now, and by the way, I highly recommend that book, but I also recommend your brand new book, Face to face, the art of human connection. It's I don't want to say it's a continuation of of a curious mind because I think the focus is slightly different, but just all of your stories in there are so great. Again, it's it's stories of this culture as it's grown around us, and you've kind of been in the center of it all. So it's it's fascinating not only to see our culture from your perspective through these stories, but also how you put yourself. It was an active, it was active engagement that you put yourself into these stories, into our culture. And that's what the face-to-face -face and the art of human connection refers to is how you did it. And it's fascinating right. stuff. Thank you. Thanks. So, so now, so, so this is just an intro about why you have Don Rickles and Tom, and all these people at Tom your weddings. And, and yeah, uh, and Eddie Murphy. And yeah. So, so what's, what's a Richard Pryor story? A Richard Pryor story was this. I had a project right after my first real big hit called Splash. It, it was out in 19... 84, it's Tom, Tom Hanks, which you knew from Bosom Buddies, and Daryl Hannah. So now I've got some juice and I can meet people. But Richard Pryor was the gigantic star. And I had a project written by the guys that, you know, really did the comedy stuff on Splash named Lola and Bablu. It was called Happy Hour. I wanted Richard Pryor so badly. I didn't know Richard Pryor, but I knew his lawyer because he had no agent. He didn't trust agents, didn't trust anyone except this one lawyer. Bottom line is I submit the script called Happy Hour to Richard Pryor, and I hear from the lawyer, Skip, oh, he, he kind of likes it, you know, give him a little time. And I keep getting the same thing from Skip. I think he likes it. Maybe you guys can meet. And this is going on for now months. And it occurred to me at this moment, I thought, I don't think Richard Pryor reads at all, hmm. which, which I'd heard a little bit, but I started to think that's probably true. So I say to Skip, look, I know Richard read it. I know he read word, every word. Let me go just meet with them only because I'm going to pitch out my take. So he doesn't have to talk. He doesn't have to, you know, talk about the script or anything like that. And, and he, Skip, arranges for me to meet Richard Pryor. Richard Pryor has a gigantic office on the Columbia Pictures lot. And it was previously occupied by the chairman of Columbia. Her name was Sherry Lansing. She became chairman of a Paramount. And he's in this giant office, and there's got to be, there's, there's four huge couches that could seat like 30 people. He says, quietly, sit down. I sit down because he spoke quietly, unless he was on stage. I sit down like this. He sits down right next to me. Our shoulders were touching. I'm, I'm so scared. Like, I'm thinking, it's Richard Pryor. 
And I told him, pitched him the entire movie. I told, like literally every scene, all the lines, I like told the story of the movie Happy Hour, shoulder to shoulder for about an hour and 15 minutes. Good story. And he said, yes, he said he'd do it. I got him to say, I mean, he said yes. And, but it was just like super uncomfortable because he sat there and just stared at me like this. Richard Pryor for about, maybe it's an hour and a half. But uh, uh, but what you, when you were saying about Richard uh, Pryor reminded me of your own battles as a child with dyslexia. You had acute yes. dyslexia. You had a hard time reading. You weren't getting good grades. Uh, but I find a lot of people that come on this podcast have suffered from dyslexia. Wow. And I wonder if on that level you may be connected with Richard Pryor. I don't know if he has dyslexia, but the way you just described him, perhaps he did. I think he probably did as well. Because I couldn't read, you know, in elementary school, I couldn't read at all. I, I couldn't look at a sentence and know what the sentence said. I couldn't read the words. I couldn't sound them out. There was just, there was no, it was, I could not learn how to read at all in any in any form. And so, it caused a lot of shame. You know, you're some sitting in third, second, third, and fourth grade, and teachers are looking at me to answer a question, and I'm looking at my shoe or trying to find my way out of the class. I have to use the bathroom because I had to, you know, like anybody, shame avoidance, you know, in that I knew I didn't know the answer. I knew I couldn't know the answer, and it, it was in, incredibly embarrassing to me and uh, hard. And so I later, once I was able to, in sixth grade, I could spell, spell and read a little bit. And, but once I was able to read, which was after the sixth grade into junior high and, every, and then high school, and of course college, um, I, I found that by look just the exact opposite, instead of looking away from people, oddly enough, that's exactly what, uh, as you've referenced, Eminem. Eminem couldn't look at the audience at all. He had to look away and remember he vomited in the bathroom and everything because yeah. it just caused him so much anxiety because early trauma caused him that anxiety so he couldn't look at people. I didn't have it that because I wasn't performing in that way, but I really could, didn't want to look at anyone in the eyes because that would mean, okay, I can talk to you. When you look at someone in the eyes, it's permission to ask a question or to engage in a conversation. So for the teacher to look in my eyes or a fellow classmate to look in my eyes in relation to anything to do with studies would be cause a tra you know would be traumatic. Particularly if the teacher, because maybe she's going to call on you to come to the board and she write would the call. Answer. Yes, exactly. And I was called many times to come to the board, and it would just be embarrassing. And I'd see kids kind of snickering or laughing, or and it was you know incredibly uncomfortable. And. Uh, it was just incredibly, it was incredibly uncomfortable. So I had to find ways to get out of that, be resourceful, find ways to get out of being picked. So, so what, what oh, so, sorry, go. And so then what I found later in life is just the opposite worked so much better, is that once I could read a little bit, I could really expand on my knowledge base and also expand on my relationships by looking directly at people, by doing the exact opposite, look them right in the eyes, feel, make my soul available to them, my heart available to them, and theirs to me. And that's when you get authentic stuff from people, is when you, we create that bridge that is honest and excited about meeting somebody. You know, because you grew up with, with dyslexia and not, uh, you had to be verbal in different ways, like through conversation and through storytelling even in order yes. to understand something we remember the things that are stories yes and so that's presumably how you you s learned in different ways from many of your peers at school or in your first jobs or whatever do you think these curiosity conversations that you that you write about in a curious mind and also led to so many of your movies obviously this was kind of an outgrowth of how you taught yourself to learn, which was so different than kind of just reading and writing and, and so on. Right. Well, it is how I taught myself to learn. I mean, I, I'm, I'm probably a, a classic autodidact in that sense. Like I just constantly ev are I'm importing information, but from people usually, just from conversations. My kids would always go, who do you think you are, dad, the mayor of Malibu? Because I literally will say hi and with an 
you know, with an open heart to people. And it doesn't ever go wrong. I mean, it always, there's always something to be gained, even if it's often just making somebody feel good. It validates the other person for being a human being. Do you think, do you think um, it's gotten a lot easier as you've gotten older and your careers obviously yeah. become much more expansive and so on? So like when you were first starting these curiosity conversations, what was the hardest conversation that you tried to get? Well, I've had so many. I mean, I, uh, Jonas Salk, who is the father of the polio vaccine. A great story about him, by the way, in this book. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, thanks. So he was really hard in that, um, well, first of all, you have to learn about the person you're going to meet because you're going to have to understand some part of the language of, in, in the case of Jonas Salk, medicine and chemistry and physics, and he lives in that space. So therefore, you have to know it enough that you understand the internal operation of what of what that is. So like in other words, when I tried to learn about show business, I couldn't understand the engine of show business until I could get through understanding the language. And once you understand the language, you decode that or demystify a language, whether it's medicine or entertainment. <laughs> um, you can't really understand the internal operation of how it works and the commonalities. So, so I love that. So what do you think is the like sort of meta grammar of things that are sufficiently complicated, like show business or medicine at the highest level? Like, are there kind of common points that you see across all these different industries? Well, um, one, okay. I would say, in all in in every business, a common thread that things access on is you have to bring something of valuable of, of value to the table. In entertainment, whether it's movies or television or short form or long form, whatever the form, whether it's arrested, you have to if you you have to either have the idea, you have to either have it or be able to buy it. I couldn't buy it, so I have to invent it. Um, probably in the same way you do. And so you have to have owned something that has some value in the equation of entertainment. So it would be either the idea or the authentic voice, like Aaron Sorkin, who did uh, West Wing. And I, he did his first show for me called Sports Night. Love Sports Night, by the way. Oh, thank you. I just remember that as also being so fun. It like changed the sitcom for me. Like it, it was so fast paced and yeah. I wasn't into sports at all, but I just loved the dialogue, the plots, the actors. Yeah. So, oh, thanks. Anyway. But I guess that I would say to answer your question, medicine or whether it's chemistry or any art form, um, tapping into your authentic voice, whatever that truth is, that truth that lives inside of your soul someplace, that thing Having being able to connect to that source is the thing that has the most value. So, so like for Jonas Salk, how did you kind of find what was authentic to you that could kind of communicate with what was authentic to him? Well, what authentic? Okay, so for authentic to me would be able to because I made a mermaid movie and everyone said it would be terrible and that it would fail, and when it didn't fail, then therefore the dumbest idea became a success. Meaning that I don't have to guess what people are thinking. I don't have to prognosticate what new trends are happening. I just have to be plugged into my inner truth and then manifest that. In the case of Jonas Salk, he did very profound things in his work, like inoculate himself with the polio vaccine mm -hmm. and found, found that it worked and didn't kill him. So, I mean, other people tr tried things like-minded to Jonas Salk, but he was unique in not only his, it's not always just the smartest person. It's the most, often it's like the most original execution of something. Yeah, so you, Jonas Salk had the most original execution of something that was in medicine. My friend, Eric Kandel, who won the Nobel prize in 2000 in medicine for memory, his thing was kind of simple if you read about it. A lot of these Nobel Prizes, they're simple things. Or Kerry Mullis for like finding that letter, finding the way to reproduce 
your DNA into a large enough quantity that it, you can read every letter in the, the, the million letters in your DNA uh, code. So, but his was pretty simple. He was, he was kind of a, I don't want to say, but he was a, uh, you, he was a unique guy. But you wouldn't say that you would not have characterized him as like a genius in many multiple areas. So he had one thing, and that one thing was profound. Case of, you know, the, even in a, a, our movie, A Beautiful Mind with John Nash, this game theory, you know, the, the Nash's theory of equilibrium. And it was ultimately, like in these game theories, and particularly Nash's, was a pretty simple thing. And we demonstrated it pretty simply with picking girls in, in that pool hall, right? Drinking in a pool yeah. hall. So it, it's really just finding the simplicity in something deeply complex, embedded into something completely complex. It's finding that needle in the haystack, which is cliche, but it's finding that and being able to pick it out, then understanding how to use that, how to make that an application for something. Yeah, like you, you. And so that's what I do, like in the movies that I do, like I try to do that. Like you were, you were talking in this book uh, about Splash and how you pitched it, and of course, in any pitch, it's it's storytelling. You're describing the story, and there's lots of different ways to tell a story. You, you know, some some hero is called into action, and and so on. But instead of you, you, you went a little bit more macro on it after you were rejected a bunch of times. Instead of just saying, here's a man who then meets a mermaid and falls in love, you, br you brought it up uh, another 10,000 feet and you said, it's really hard to find love in this world. Yes. And, and that's kind of how you, the call to the extraordinary yes. is this man trying to find love in this absurdist situation. Exactly. That's, that's really well said. It's exactly right. After failing over and over again at, at, at selling the story, I realized I got to bump it up to a different... I have to change my pitch, <laughs> and I have to elevate it and tell it from a different perspective. Forget the story of a man and a mermaid and all that stuff. It's, what if you're a guy that is succeeding at a lot of things except one thing? You're handicapped by one thing. You're a good-looking guy. You own a produce company. You've got, you know, cool life. With the exception of one thing, you cannot, you haven't found love. You're trying like hell to find love, and you can't make that happen. That connection is, is it me? Is it them? What's, why am I out of alignment with the world on this one thing? And, and then you, then you bump it up to a, to a higher level, and you say, everybody roots for love. Everybody. So when everybody would ding me out and say, that doesn't work, we don't want to do the mermaid movie, or we don't really see it as a love story, I would just ignore when they say, I don't want to see it as a love story. I, I don't see that. I, go, I would go to a theme, to big universal theme. Like you have to root for love. Everybody roots for love. We all know that love is a healer. And so that's kind of how I would, you know, break through. Like you did that in... A Beautiful Mind as well. Uh, you, you yes. Instead of saying, hey, we got this great story about this economist yeah. and game theory. Or I want to show, I'm going to do a movie about a schizophrenic. Forget it. Yeah, but you, you said- No one would do that. What, what is it like to be different? And we, that's, again, this macro language that we can all relate to. Yes. But the thing about it is, and which relates really to this book, because I did have this flashpoint moment like two years ago, I thought- Oh my God, none of these movies, whether it's A Beautiful Mind or your movie, Eight Mile, none of them ever would have happened without like the bridge of eye contact. Mm -hmm. the, oh, just the, that, the bridge of eye contact of looking at somebody in the eyes, but not staring at them, not in, affect in an affected way, in a real way. I want to see you and you want to see me. We're seeing each other and we're, open, we're opening our minds up to each other, even if it's brief. That becomes the bridge to trust. And with trust, you gain these insights. And what I did was I would harvest these insights, not knowing how the dots would ever connect, but they do. They did and they do. I think that's an important thing you mentioned, which is that you don't need to go into one of these conversations with an agenda. Because no. I think then that allows the learning to flow. But at the same time, it's a little harder then to provide 
value when you bring someone into one of these conversations. Like, how do you, because because there is no agenda. You're not saying to when you had Marshall Mathers, aka yeah. Eminem, in your office for the first time, you were having one of these conversations. Yeah, there wasn't necessarily the agenda. Let's make a movie. And how do you? So you weren't necessarily off, offering value right at that moment. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I always, when I really reduce, when I, redu okay, when I reduce that, what I say to myself is I have to make this the best date for the person that I'm inconveniencing. So whoever I'm asking to come, whether okay. it's, you, you know, uh, Shelley Glasgow who also won a Nobel prize for reducing the four forces of nature to three by saying there's this force called electro weak. And I spent five hours with this man. I found him so interesting. I was going to go to the Galapagos Islands with him. Like, just because he said, let's do it. Now he's going with other scientists. But basically, what you have to do is you have to, um, you have to make it their best date. You have to come to the table with little treasures, like pieces of information. The, did you know this, Marshall? Or did you know that, Marshall? Or... Shelly, did you ever did you did you ever go to the Galapagos Islands? I said that, and he said, "Well, I'm going with National Geographic, but it, we're using their boat, and we're going with a group of other scientists. Would you guys like to go?" I said, "I'd like to, but I didn't. I, I really regret not going on this one trip, and I'm pretty spontaneous. I, as you, when you read this book, you'll see a friend of mine said, "Do you want to go to Dakar?" I didn't know where it was. I said yes, <laughs> and I didn't know Dakar was in Senegal in Western Africa. Mm. Like I, but I'd said yes, and I I went. I was super super glad I went too. So you were, you were describing this this meeting with this first meeting with Eminem, and yeah. he wasn't looking at you, and you're having a hard time connecting. And he as the hard. meeting was winding down, you asked this like odd question to him. At least I thought I would not have thought to ask this question. You you said to him, "Do you animate?" Yeah. <laughs> and then kind of I don't know how why or how that that seemed to break the wall, and then you you guys started talking. Why did you ask that particular question? Well, I was incredibly desperate. I was really desperate because I'd sat with him. It felt like an hour, but it was probably was 30 straight minutes. And he wouldn't look at me at all. He just looked forward with, with a kind of a icy glare. Um, and I'd, I'd talk and I was generating, I was trying every way to sort of engage him, but it wasn't working. And my friend Jimmy Iovine was in another chair and he was just watching me sink to the ground, and and um, and basically, um, he said, "I'm out." He, after he didn't say one word, he just said, "I'm out." And then he got his hand to the door, and I thought, I just desperately, I thought, what made me want to meet Marshall Mathers is he, I found him very animated when I watched him through the lens of you know television on the VMA awards, and I thought, I just said come on, you can animate. And uh, I think it worked because it sh surprised him. I think it first it made him, I think, angry with me. And then I think he thought, I don't know what happened, but he came back and he told what became the basis of what was the movie 8 Mile. Yeah, it Which seemed... was a, a treasure. Yeah, no, it was a, a beautiful movie. And it seems like, with a lot of these conversations with whether it's Eminem or Jonas Salk, you mentioned how Jonas Salk injected himself with the polio vaccine and kind of that, that decision making on his part is what propelled him to great you, heights, great heights, like, like phenomenal. Like he changed the entire world. And I love this quote in your book, uh, <clears throat> where you say, uh, it's by this guy, Billy Cox. Uh, he says, uh, make sure you are more committed to change than you are committed to your comfort zone. And it seems like a lot of the people you talk to are really, they, they make it a point that they're going to be something different. They're going to blaze their own path as opposed to uh, being in the comfort zone. And that's what creates their success. Yes. Yeah. I mean, now it's become more popularized for, you know, these tech titans to say, just be curious. But, 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 when you're when you really use that muscle of curiosity, um, you do have to get outside your comfort zone because you're meeting new people, you're challenging yourself to be great, you're seeking out people that are good or great at something. It could just be they're connected to their authentic self. It could be they're the 
you know, I've met, I've learned so much from Uber drivers. I've learned so much from so many types of people. They're not just all Nobel laureates and superstars like Michael Jackson or something. But it, it's it's getting outside of your comfort zone forces you to up your game. And I'm almost I'm almost only comfortable now when I'm outside my comfort zone because I I use this discipline every day. I do something that pushes me a little bit. Like in the in the past six months, for instance, let's say after you handed this, you finished writing this book, you handed it in. Now you're working on new projects. W what's changed the most in your life and in your work life in the past six months by pushing yourself outside of the comfort zone? Um. Well, I, I don't know exactly. You have to help me with that question. But the first thing that comes to mind is I make, I'm uh, building my company. Imagine. And uh, there's probably a better answer than this, but I'm building my company, Imagine. Therefore, we've bought other companies. We've created a documentary division. I have a content accelerator that's modeled after Y Combinator, which is a tech startup accelerator. So I'm doing a tech, I'm doing a tech company, but it's a, it's an accelerator that helps democratize voices, enable voices from all over the world to have a chance to be in Hollywood, so where they don't have to just struggle and be a million miles away and never get in yeah no this this does answer the question because for whatever it was 30 years or so more than 30 years you've had imagine entertainment with ron howard yeah and i will say again just from a thirty thousand for perspective not knowing anything the problem you probably had with imagine is that it was so closely identified with the two of you yeah so probably when people were trying to say well what's the value of this if if brian and ron shut the lights out <laughs> at night there's no value yeah so now probably the, the thing that's changing what you just described to me is you're trying to figure out how to create equity value that yeah goes beyond you if you're not there yeah we're trying to find mini me's <laughs> no i, mean, I or, said or that at jokingly least, at least chain you know at least cha you know streams of yeah. income yeah that, that could live beyond yeah. i shouldn't have said that because you were like on a good path actually i love it because well, well we now i'm so proud actually of our we have super smart people running like our documentaries. So the president of documentary are, we have 15 documentaries that are being made. One is opening the Toronto Film Festival on Robbie Robertson and the band with Bob Dylan. There's another one actually in the film festival that's very central called Dads about what it's like, all versions of types of dads, you know, where we interview oh, them. I have to see that. Uh, tomorrow night I have the Wu-Tang Clan premiere, which is started because I met ODB 25 years ago, which led me to the RZA, which caused me to really understand their, their, the Eastern thought that they incorporated into their band, which was differentiating, which caused me to hire the RZA to be in a, a movie of mine as an actor, which was, I think, his first time, called American Gangster, which caused me to later, so let's do the whole Wu-Tang Clan because we get to do the Tao of Wu, which I, was so interesting to me how he, they, they were to assimilate this gang of 10 guys for the most part, all of them found a way to integrate an Eastern thought into their felonous minds, <laughs> you know? And, and not only did they perform music, but they, they redirected their energy towards something that was productive and positive. And they're still together. Yeah, and they're still together. <laughs> Which is really unusual for, I know. across all genres of Method music. Method Man's one of the exec producers. I mean, it's cool. Going back to your original thing, it's like the guy that, so I could definitely, I'm super proud of the people that run our divisions. Justin Wilkes and Sarah Bernstein run the documentaries. Then I have someone I just saw this morning. His name is Tony Hernandez and his wife, Lily Burns. They have 16 shows on the air, like Russian Dolls. They have a bunch of Emmys coming their way. And they're, I, I just was able to buy their company and be partners with them and like, they could run our company. They are, all these people are so super qualified. My TV division is really like young people that are like 40 years old that are killing it. In movies, I have a new person because I changed what was a old school vertical power structure to a horizontal structure. So that basically I just have one person and then I pick people that are really super passionate and I just bet on them. And I throw, you know, I put money on them. I pay for their office and everything and have the, and I support them with with all of my 
you know, credibility and energy and with money to build their careers. So I, I find it all really challenging and interesting. And you're right, it um, will will further the legacy of what we've been doing for a while. You know, and and now with all of these different streaming services opening up, do you see that there's more opportunities than ever to create good content? Or does that somehow limit the window of good content? Like take Russian Dolls as an example. And I don't yeah. mean to get so much in the weeds, but uh, that was such a great show. But it's kind of hit or miss whether someone's even heard of it because there's hundreds of yeah. shows on TV. Most of them not good. That was a great yeah. one. But... Uh, uh, what do you think? What do you think is happening right now in entertainment? Well, there's an oversight. Well, right now because, um, well, first of all, there's a consolidation of these platforms, right? So they just are the big ones have gotten twice as big, and you know, but ultimately to direct uh, your, myself to your, their exact, there's an oversaturation of content. It's there's so much content, it's hard to find anything, and you, after you're looking or trying to curate, you know, what's going to be best for you. You're almost too tired to even watch it after you've done that. So it's more incumbent today than ever, more 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 today than ever, to have sexy or sexy and original ideas, ideas that are going to break through. And that was always a strength of mine. Actually, was prospecting unique ideas. Well, so, again, because it's so related to to how you learned. So you, yeah. you, you needed stories. to I had to, to get to people's learn. attention immediately and they, or they had to get mine. So getting someone's attention immediately was something I was kind of trained, trained myself to do. So like if someone's pitching you a story, like let's take somebody who, who has recently pitched you, what are the, what are the elements are you looking for in, in them, in the story? You know, what kind of, what does get your attention or what has? Well, I look at it like kind of like this. I always... I, I trans I sort of transport myself to being like an assistant that works for 60 minutes. And I'm working for one of those guys on 60 minutes. And I only have a few minutes a week to get Dan Rather's attention or whoever is on that show. I have to say, did you know the following, Mr. Rather? You know, and then you have to come up with like a did you know kind of a question. That that you know the answer to, but he doesn't. So if you can't pull that off, you shouldn't even be in the room, hmm. I think. And then you have to support it. You have to case build it when Dan Rather or you know whoever it is, or you're working for Howard Stern for that matter. You have to then say, well, this is what it is, and this is why you've never heard of it. Or if or if they say, no, I heard of that. You have to say, but did you know they were all like millennials that did this? You know, or whatever. You have to have, you have to, you have to game out your case so that it's that it's proofed out, so it works. You know, but for me, I like bigger, big subjects. You know, like it, like we did the, we did. Um, you have to do these things well. When we did the Beatles, uh, we did eight day. We did a documentary documentary called Eight Days a Week. Now, we were close to failing at that where I know that Paul McCartney and I also know that Ringo separately saw rough cuts and they were not happy with it. Hmm. But then I thought, Ron, like you're, we're both, you know, you're, you know, he was primarily doing it, but I thought, we cannot fail at this. This is a big subject. So if you fail at a big subject, you're screwed. But if you win at a big subject, everybody pays attention and we all won Grammys for doing that. Um, we just did Pavarotti and for a documentary, it was like one of the highest grossing documentaries. But for the, for the Beatles, like what was your, did you know, like, what were you able to imagine you're talking, it's you talking to the audience through that documentary. Okay. What was your, did you know? Well, okay. So eight days a week was about their tour, tour, uh, touring years when they were on tour. What, what I think the key thing was, did you know that the Beatles all had an equal vote? And if they didn't all vote for a song, it didn't happen. Hmm. If they all I didn't, didn't vote for an action, they didn't do the action. They were, it was a very democratic partnership between four savants. And how, so, how did four savant geniuses, and we showed this scene, 
There's two little tiny single beds, two guys in each bed. They'd sleep, basically sleep together. They had no money. But they had to agree, and they had to create, and they had to produce. So they would produce a song a week, you know, or more than that, really. So they were incredibly prolific during the touring years. I think they had 145 songs or something. They were all hits. And they all had to agree. And a lot of their great songs, some of this, some songs didn't make it. Of course, like if you if you're to look at uh, George Harrison's stuff, um, all things must pass. Or many songs in in that hit album did not exist because they you know they you know they didn't all agree at the time on on those songs. I, I did not know that. Yeah. And so but- so those did so did you know it and you know a lot that that was the captivating uh, event. It, it's so interesting because the, the the Beatles I also think of in terms of uh, the book Outliers, which you're, are you, are you? I am doing it. Yeah, you're working on a TV series? Uh... Yeah, Malcolm Gladwell, who wrote the book Outliers, um, he's been a great friend, similar hair. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always, I'm, people stop me in the street and say, are you Malcolm Gladwell? Yeah, do they really? Yeah, I say yes, of course. But. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. That's, that's, I'll tell him. I'm seeing him tomorrow, actually, at three. I'll have to get a photograph of you and I. His, his latest book, by the way, is pretty good, too. I, I, it's I, very I good. Bet. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, oh, yeah. So we're doing his book, Outliers, as a limited series. And so um, um, he mentions the Beatles pretty early on in Outliers when he's uh, popularizing the 10,000-hour the rule. But I was thinking about the 10,000-hour rule when I was reading your book, this latest book. And it's also interesting to me when people do 10,000 experiments as opposed to 10,000 hours. This is another way of kind of gaining That's um, knowledge. Which is it a, is. And it, it strikes me that the Beatles did that a lot. They were they would try some experiments. They, they did, they, they did 10,000 trial and error experiments. Yeah, and that kind of catapults you also it to sure greatness. It sure does. Or what you said about Jonas Salk, for instance. Yeah. And what you do by, it, it's got to be out of your comfort zone to you know, reach out to somebody and say, hey, I want to talk, Eminem, I want to talk to you. I want to talk to you. Or Michael Jackson or Princess Di or... You, or you, Vladimir... Or Vladimir Putin, which is in the book, but you have to, that's an interesting story. You have to check that out. But, um, you know, any one of these people, they're just, you have to work, you know, you have to work at it pretty hard to get someone where your agendas don't seem to overlap or they don't seem to intersect. You have to be persistent and informed and kind of captivating. So I, I think I think probably anyone. But anyone would... can do this. I mean, I did it. I was I, I wasn't even a C student. I was like a DF student. You can people. I don't ask people to do things in my books that 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 are superpower things. They become the eye contact and curiosity. I just worked on them very 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 hard. And make sure that I'm incredibly present with things like that. And I learn from, you know, from that. I just learn and improve upon myself, you know, just very incrementally. But it's a lot of these trial and error experiments that that get me there. Right, because you also talk about how, you know, how important it is connecting to that authentic self. That's what allows you to kind of reach in and find out from Eminem, just using that as an example of, what you're curious about to get him to what you're authentically curious about to get him to open up. Yes. And I think that's part of it too. And I think part of it also, like you said earlier, is kind of balancing that providing value with having no agenda at the same time. Yes. I think this goes like, I think that to me, cutting to the, to the chase on the, to the center of this is that I think people are intuitive animals and they, they form an opinion based on energetics, how your energy feels. Now, all the other stuff fills that in, like what you say and what you do. And are you sitting with your arms like that? Are you sitting in a power position? Are you sitting in a, you know, how, all that body language or physiognomy matters. But really, they f- people feel your energy. If you feel someone's energy, you then start to feel their intentionality. And I think if you're really open, if you have a good heart, you don't want to hurt anybody, you don't want to screw somebody over. If you can, if you're genuinely well-intended, uh, you know, an intention, intended person, intentioned person, um, people feel that, and then they forgive you for 
spelling, <laughs> your punctuation or mistakes, or I said a stupid thing. I'll just go, well, that was such a dumb thing. And then people love honesty. So you're allowed to screw up. You're allowed to, you know, I don't, do you ever ding people out for spelling and punctuation if they have a good idea? No, and no, I, I I don't spell and punctuate so well, so <laughs> far be it for me to but, criticize. So, I think I think if we, you know, I think, you know, just being able to connect to the better side of oneself and express that, you know, in you know, in in earnest, will gain you a lot. And if by looking at somebody, just looking at somebody, not in a weird way, but just in a way like, hey, I'm glad to see you. You're not saying it. I learned in public speaking, which I was, by the way, I'm, I'm a pretty good public speaker. I, I mean, I'm, I'm unafraid and I can speak to 25,000 people and be okay with it. But why? Because in college, my freshman year in college, we had a, I had a teacher, Mr. French, the speech teacher, who said, oh, could you stay behind for a minute? To me, class of 150. He said, you know, I've never done this, but I'm going to recommend you drop out of college. I go, wow, okay. And he said, uh, I just, I feel pretty strongly after being with you that this is just not, sh shouldn't be your route. I think going to an occupational school, dropping out of college is going to be better suited for you. And I thought, wow, that's pretty hardcore. <laughs> that's pretty cold. But, um, and it, later in life, I thought, I'm going to try to master this somehow. And uh, I make lots of mistakes when I public speak, but people they they feel you and they feel goodness or they or they like the you know the basis of the story most importantly if you go out and you probably know this too cuz you you public speak yourself if you go out offering people thanks you're grateful to be there and you go thanks for coming here for if you just say that it's going to it's it's it help, helps everything you know it just related to that too and I'm um, I'm not saying anything you don't know, but I find it's always very helpful to call out what the crowd is thinking. So if, if you, you make a mistake, that, yeah, that'd be amazing. It, like if you make a mistake in your talk, the crowd's thinking he just did, said this. Yeah, <laughs> and if you call it out, like, "Oops, I said that," then they're all gonna laugh, and then you move on. Yeah, you're a thousand percent true. Right, my wife Veronica uh, periodically would go to go with me to some of these times where I speak, and recently, I think it was at Summit. Um, the Summit Series, it was at LA, downtown. And I was asked a question, and I know I was telling, I was telling a story, and then I, I actually said, I lost track of where I was going. So I said, I can't have, I have no idea what the question was. <laughs> and everybody did, they thought that was kind of funny, but it was really honest. I forgot, I completely forgot what the question was. And I think having that almost like childlike honesty is, is very important. Like uh, we mentioned, Putin before, and you flew all the way to Moscow because you thought you were going to be meeting him. I don't, I won't, I won't, no spoilers, but there was a moment in there where things could have changed radically yes. if you kind of went along with certain, certain things that were being told. And instead you were like, no, 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 I'm, I have, you, you, you had to be honest. You said exactly what you were there for and things went a different route. And yeah, cause I could, I could see that nobody was going to save me. You know, like, so I had to save myself. But 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 also you had to be honest in a situation where probably a lot of people after making that trip and doing all the things you did probably wouldn't be honest. They would probably say, okay, somehow some yeah. white lies are being set up for me to, to get something I want. So I'm going to just ride with this. Probably yeah. a lot of people would go that route. But you were like, yeah. no. And, and I always think it's very important that even the, the, the small honesties lead to the bigger honesties. Yeah, that's very interesting. But, yes. that, but, but you kept to that core... And so, you know, that altered what happened on that trip. Yes, exactly. Well, did you consider, you know, going along for the ride with what everybody else was saying? No, I, I didn't consider going along with the ride. I didn't consider that. I considered, I was sort of too scared to say anything. It was more like I looked in the room with a couple of the people that brought me there. I, I was thinking they were going to say, they would speak up and save me. But then I realized they weren't. And that's when I thought, I can't go through with this because that lie will lead to a bigger lie, which will lead to a bigger problem. It just, no. So I, I didn't, 
I, I knew something had to change. Did you ever uh, find yourself in a situation where, uh, you know, like when you're persuading, so you, you, to make a movie or a TV series and you're the producer, you have to, do, you have to convince so many people to share yeah. in a single vision. You have to convince yeah. writers, actors, directors, the crew, the, the investors, the studios, the audience, you know, where, where, are there ever little compromises that you make along the way or what, what has sort of kind of bothered you sometimes about the process? Well, okay. So what, okay. So the process of making a movie or a television show is a really, you know, if you're, it's, it's a very long, it's a long journey and you start with an idea. So that's, an, it's not even written and it's, you know, completely amorphous. It's like a gas that you're trying to, Wait, eventually wave some magic wand and it becomes a solid, right? It's just vapor. So you have an idea and then you're trying to get a lot of people to believe in this idea. So that's what I would do is I'd get impregnate, try to create words, passion, you know, fortified by passion to get, you know, an important writer or important director or an actor or all of them to believe, to follow you on this path, you know? out of a foxhole onto the field, you know? So um, it's it's hard. You have to be, you know, you have to evangelize your passion, your vision. It must be frustrating because actually so few things get made and you've made so much. And I've made, I have, I have made so much, yes. <laughs> I mean, and given that there's tens of billion dollars being poured into content now, it still seems just as hard to get things made. And, and it almost seems like the math doesn't add up. It's so hard to get things made. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Well, I mean, if the, if the platform is prescriptive, they tell you to do something, and I guess you could fill the order, you know, like a pharmacist. But I always, I, I try to, because they, they're all so hard, even if, you, even if you get the yes, then it's hard to make it, then it's hard to have it be success, then you have to market it, you have to make it distinguishable, then it has to be reach people, then it has to connect on an emotional basis. And uh, I mean, I would always say I'm in the feelings business. And that probably, is, I was just thinking when I was on your show, just now in the show, I thought maybe that all connects to the dyslexia thing that I, I, I really relate to feelings much more than I do you know, literal thing is things that are highly, that would be highly literal. So I always just felt like I'm in the feelings business. So if you're not igniting fe real feelings out of people, it's not going to be memorable. So ultimately, if you're going to try to do all those things and have it line up and work and be successful, um, you, you should probably just stick with your own ideas. <laughs> well, well, because like, you know, at least you can, at least you can mine your inner self and go, this is what I would do. This is what I think. In other words, in, any, in order to make any story work in movies or television, it has to have an emotional logic that holds up. Because in other words, human beings, there's emotional logic that make them fear things or make them love things or you know, run from them or run towards them. So you have to find the emotional logic and the way to find emotional logic is it has to be true. So if you live inside yourself and in and inside the few people that you really feel like you know their what that schematic looks like, their emotional schematic, well you're going to have a good chance of having that be honest and real. That's what Aaron Sorkin does perfectly and that's how why he can write every single word of every single episode of West Wing. <laughs> or these amazing movies or plays or To Kill a Mockingbird, because he's living the emotional logic of it, and he is certain that's it. Where, where do you think the emotional logic hasn't worked in a, in a movie that got made or a story that got written? Of mine or something Or else? just in general? Oh, no, just learn by counterexample. Well, sometimes action movies are kind of, pa they're just sort of packaged. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're, they, they kind of run on you know, again, this is kind of a cliche, but they run on like on excitement or high octane. And then the internal engine of it isn't real, hmm. but the great ones usually are, I mean, or a great fantasy film. I mean, of course, Star Wars, which has lived on and on and on and on and on is because it was formed on real emotional logic formed from 
these great stories, you know, Man with a Thousand Faces or other, uh, um, you know, that kind of stuff. Well, well, yeah, so that, that arc of the hero that we were even talking about earlier, like, and it seems like, you know, the first part of the arc of the hero is your hero is going from, he gets a call to <clears throat> action from the ordinary world to the extraordinary world. And you were describing this and how you pitched Splash. It almost wasn't quite extraordinary enough that Tom Hanks met a mermaid. It had to be more extraordinary or more kind of global. He had to he had to fall in love with somebody in a very difficult world for for doing that. Yeah. And, and you 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 had to find the right arc to to get people on board with your vision. Yeah, I did. Yes. Yeah, you. I did. But but the but the 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 simple internal engine is just a guy falling and needing to fall in love. Otherwise, he's handicapped. You know, he's got that's his disability. Is that he's got everything is working, all his material world is working, but he can't. But love is is fundamentally the most important thing, one of the most important things there is, and he can't achieve it, and so therefore he's kind of broken. And so I thought, how would he go? But how would a guy find the perfect girl? Well, then you have to say, well, what is the perfect girl? And then you say, well, she'd be. You know, she's pretty, but she's honest and she's not manipulating you and you're not manipulating her. All these things are are, are real and honest. And, 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 and then I thought, well, wh- how do I make this even more, even harder, make, make her even more unattainable? I thought, well, I'll make her a mermaid because then that there's separate obstacles to, that, w- that would involve that. And it's such a funny- And again- it's fantastical. Yeah, yeah, because like if you think about like even think of other Tom Hanks rom coms, what makes the woman unattainable sometimes is she lives across the country, like sleepless yeah. in Seattle, or uh, she's at the small bookstore, he's at the big bookstore. Yeah. Like you know, you've got mail, so you made it like absurdist. You took it to an extreme. Oh, she's a mermaid. Yeah, or she's yeah. an alien. Whatever yeah. it could be, is being as absurd as possible. Or again, there's that dissonance in like a beautiful mind. Uh, here's this guy who's a genius, genius, but it's there's also he's got schizophrenia. There's this gap between his knowledge and his ability to make use of that knowledge. Yeah, that's true. So it, you're pretty good at diagnosing these. Things. I like to, I like to analyze your your movies. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but the ones that don't work are anytime the ones whether they're mine or someone else's. Well, anytime where people, anytime when people prognosticate um, what people like, like oh no, I know the audience will like this. Any you could tell when phony stuff like that happens. You feel it because it's not, it doesn't reach you. You can tell packaged stuff. Um, and again, there's they're they're often they're they're like either um, they're not. They're more action movies. They're not thrillers. Great thrillers are great because they really operate on something primal inside of you. Um, a comedy. Okay, let's, I wanted to finish this one thought, but but basically, so anytime people are guessing what people are going to feel and it's not really real, I I get kind of bummed out. I don't like it. I found that anytime I rationalized, I want every decision because there's so many decisions that have to be made. Like. Who's going to shoot it? What is it going to look like? Is it going to be, is the color palette light or dark or this or that? Anytime I go, I fold, to, you know, like I, I, I'm in a conversation and I feel like, oh, it's going to be good enough. It's always shitty. Hmm. I've done that many times where I thought, where people go, it's good enough. And I go, you're right, it is good enough. Then I feel like I'll move on. I'll go to sleep now. I'll wake up the next day with a new problem. That problem never goes away. <laughs> How do you push yourself to go beyond good enough? Um, I either ask, uh, well, I'm pr- I, I either, uh, how do I, tr- I, I either ask really smart people. I'm a pretty collab- secretly collaborative person. I'm collaborative in the group, and I also will say to smart friends, what do you think of this? And I'm kind of Socratic that way. Hmm. And so I think that's always a good thing, is to test hard, you know, the hard decisions on other people rather than just fold. Like, what would you do? Or, you know, I always, I, I put it out to other smart people and get a sense of, am I compromising? I, I like that technique. It's sort of like when you're asking them for advice, gives them status. They're not going to yeah. steer you wrong or they're going to try their hardest to 
to guide you correctly. And people like to help other people. And, and, and it always comes back, you know, it all sort of evens itself out. So, so Brian Grazer, I don't, I, you're, you you've, you've given us a, a great hour of your time. Uh, <laughs> thanks so much to coming all the way to the, the comedy club here. Nice. Uh, I love the book face to face, the art of human connection. I also loved your prior book, a curious mind. I I've gained so much from the book. And also I really love this. Uh, did you know technique? Oh, good. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to use it. I'm so, I, I don't have a did you know? Did you know there's 33.8 million rats in New York City? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. So so here's the question I have. Uh-oh. Who counted those rats? <laughs> I have no idea. I want to find this I don't out. Know. There's some data center that did. Maybe it's Maybe. A, yeah. But um That's well, probably a week you. did you know versus yeah. the ones you, a Nobel, the did you a Nobel know Prize thing, thing. The the good did you know thing is you have to like the idea you're saying, did you know? It's sort of a it's sort of a backdoor way into selling your story. Um, and then if they, if you, if you can answer all three or four or five questions that that person asks you, um, I mean, if they, if they can answer those questions, you could prove your, you could prove that you're wrong, but if you're prepared, you often will be right. <laughs> well, on that note, thanks so much, okay. Brian Grazer, for, for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. You're so welcome. Loved being here. Thank you. Thanks. All right. These days, we're all investors, trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information.